Hello. <laughs> Believe it or not, I'm here at our, in my workplace in Seed. So between Manchester, Israel, and even Edgeware, uh, we can be in different places <laughs> and just manage to somehow zoom in and get connected. And I really just don't want to take up time. Um, I just wanted to really say thank you, thank you to Essie. She knows what I mean because it's always a pleasure to phone and she says, yes, sure, I'm going to do this. So when I looked at her title and I thought this is something and she's going to explain her side to you, but when we talk about let us make man, it's Hashem together with the angels that we create, but we have to make that in creation itself. So I thank Essie for growing together with us with that and for being able to participate in being one of Hashem's angels and being here that we can all learn together. Um, Thursday night has become an absolute sacred amongst us. And tonight, tonight I just ask everybody that we learn in the one in the merit of the safety of the safety of the Jewish people. I just watched a little clip of an orphanage being evacuated, young Jewish children in Odessa, and the fear of the rest of the Ukrainians and really everybody. So let us all together learn. Let's make sure that we create and put and take what we learn and internalize it and make sure that we do this, all of us together. Essie, thank you for being with us. Everybody, thank you for coming to join us in our learning, in our Erev Shabbos, in our Erev Shabbat learning. I'm going to be making challah with some ladies here in the merit of a Rafur Shalema, and I look forward to being back with you at the end. So I'm not leaving you for the whole evening. And um, enjoy, and I look forward to listening later. Thanks, Can you Essie. Hear me Can you hear me? Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you all. And um, let's begin. Joanne, thank you for the opportunity. Um, okay, so let us make man. When Hashem created the world, he, the Pasuk says, um, and Hashem said, Na as Adam, bet salmenu uvidmutenu. And the Mepharshim asked, the commentators asked, rightly so, why is Hashem saying, Betzalmenu, Uvid Mutenu, why is Hashem saying, let us, na'ase, in plural, we don't believe in a treesome. And Rabbi Shimshon Rafael Hirsch very beautifully explains this point. It's brought up in many different Mephashim as well. That when Hashem says after, na'ase, Adam, Betzalmenu, Uvid Mutenu, the Pasuk then finishes off when, Vayitzar Esa Adam, and Hashem created man, Betzelem Elohim bara oto. In the Tselem, in the form of Hashem, he created him. But it doesn't say, Uvid Mutenu, and that he created him with his dmus, with his image. It says, let us make man in our image and in our form. But then when man is made, it says, and man was born. Elokim bara oto. What happened to the dmus? Where is the dmus? We only have a tselem here. So, Hakadosh Baruch Hu was what the Rav Shimshon Rafael Hirsch says that the plural in the pasuk is referring to you and me, to man himself, to the potential of every single one of us. So when Hashem made us. He said, let us make man, you and me. I will give you, says Hashem, the potential. I will give you your selim, which will be your all your attributes, all your, besides with your physical being, obviously, all your attributes, all your tendencies, your good meters, your bad meters, your, your, your strength, your weaknesses. And then... It's down to you to finish off the job. You will finish the creation by every day living and becoming, growing, actualizing your potential. You will become Bid Musenu as well. 
And where do we see that? Man is made from the Adama. It says that man is called Adam. What is Adam? From the Adama. So the Adama is earth. And the earth is referred to when it comes to the Midas, um, the Midas clock, which Revolvi use, uses when he talks about um, self-correction, bettering yourself in, in his Musa book, Ali Shul, he brings the Adama in the, in the, in the power of, of access, pulling you down, being a couch potato, basically. So when, when a person can be Adama, like the Adama, or it can be the Adam, I'm talking about the Adam, that the root is the same as Adama, or it can be like Adame. What does that mean? I will be like, and the Pasuk says, Adame le Elyon. I will be like Hashem, like the divine. I will, I will like to be, I will be like Hashem. I received the Tselen from Hashem. I received my, my form, right? The, the, the potential. And it's down to me to actualize myself, to be like Hashem. How do we do that? So when, at the end of our lives, after 120 and three days, it shouldn't be a surprise, Hashem will say, did you become who you can be? Were you you, right? He won't say to you, were you Joah? Were you Moshe Rabbeinu? Were you Sarai Rabbeinu? No. He will say, were you Annie? Were you Rose? Were you, right? He will, you, you'll be asked with your Hebrew name. What might, you know, were you Sarah, Rachel, etc.?" And you will say, yes, of course I was. I was kind, I was generous, and Hashem will say, yes, but, but kind, I made you kind. Generous, you were created generous. So what Hashem wants to hear from us is how did we take our gifts, how did we take our attributes and use them for the better, or how did we take our weaknesses and overcome them, overcome in order to become. So we're using the different midas, Chesed, in order to love, give love, accept love, do Chesed in the world. Gvura, which is translated loosely as mighty, it's a wrong translation, it's, um, it's restraint, it's overcoming in order to become. So when, when Hashem will say to you, do, were you you? Did you become you? Could, did you become who you can be? How are we doing that? We need to think. Hashem thinks good, I will think good. Hashem does good to others, I will do good to others. Hashem does, if it's mercy, I will be mercy like Hashem. So we need to, to put a lot of effort into becoming that which I can become. A, cl a, a classic example is yesterday, and my husband is away at the moment for the, for the week, and, and yesterday I was like the chauffeur galore. This one needed to go here, that one needed to go there. This one needed to be fetched from here, that one needed to be fetched from here. You have to go here. You have to at 10.15 or 10.20 at night, when it was another pickup yet again, I couldn't face getting into the car. And I literally had to, I had to psych myself up. I got a phone call, mommy, you said I should come home at 10. Da, 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 da. I'm coming to get you. I got in the car and I literally went, Essie, it's chesed. You are now exercising chesed. Just, I just, the whole way I'm doing chesed, I'm doing chesed, I'm doing chesed. Just, and it was, it literally made, made, it made it easier for me because I knew I'm, I'm actualizing my potential. So you need to, but, but more than that, it's how do I exercise chesed, for example, being positive. It's I think good when others didn't think good about me. I was, I, somebody said something not nice to me, and I thought, I'm going to think something nice about you. And in my mind, I'm going to change the way I'm thinking. I, I smile to someone when I didn't feel like smiling. Why did you do this to me? I know you wanted to give me an opportunity, Hashem, to become more like you. So when a person does something despite not feeling like it, and he does it for the reason of becoming like Hashem, that is true growth. So we need to live in a, in a, with, a, with a mindset with, of an awareness that I want to do and why I want to do in order to get closer to Hashem. These daily little encounters are, are how we become. Uh, this is how we actualize our potential. We need to be with an understanding and a recognition 
that it's one thing to know in your head, you can know the whole Torah in your head, but if you don't apply it to your life in a very real way, it's like Asab. Who was Asab? Yaakov's twin. They both had a task in this world to achieve together a tikkun, a, a, a men, amending the, the sin of Adam, of, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, of eating from the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And they were supposed to work together as a team. Asa was supposed to serve Yaakov according to the, to the prophecy that Rivka had while she was pregnant with them. And, and together they would achieve the, the task of fill, um, fulfilling uh, the tikkun for the, for the sin of, of the eating from the tree. Um, Asa refused to do his part because he wanted to serve Hashem the way he wanted to serve Hashem. I want to do it my way, not Hashem's way. So people find a lot of excuses to why they do things when, they, when it's not comfortable to do it Hashem's way. And there's a zillion reasons that we can find. It's always, you know, the Yetzirah has many, many avenues and ways to, you know, convince us. And this was Asaf, and Asaf fooled himself. He believed he was a tzaddik. He had no issues with how he was because he thought, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm keeping Torah. He fooled himself to ask, to the point that he asked his brother, his father, you know, how do I mice, how do I take a tent from the, from the, do I need to take a tent from the soul, right? Why? Because he, he, well, he tricked himself to believe that he was right. He kept the Torah in his head. He thought he knew it all and he kept the Torah in his head, but he didn't apply it on a day-to-day -day basis to his action, to his action, to his thought, in terms of I'm applying it to my heart and to my body, to my drives, and therefore his head was buried in Mara Samachbela, in where he was supposed to be, and his body wasn't buried there because he didn't apply. He didn't do this. something called it's a pasuk in a, in a verse in the Torah that says the Yodata Hayom, and you shall know today. And you shall bring it into your heart. And bring it into your heart. How do you do that? Through every day, recognizing with every interaction you have with another human being, that this is about my growth. This is about actualizing my potential. Where Mr. Salant says very beautifully, the other person's physical needs, and I would add emotional, uh, your spiritual growth. Whenever we feel like we're being completely pulled out of our comfort zone, and even if it's not completely, it's just a bit, um, things are not necessarily convenient, conveniencing me for the sake of another person, and it doesn't matter who this other person is, it means there's an opportunity for growth here. So um, there, there are some people to the, to the point that, you know, when you're thinking to do good and you're thinking in Hashem's world as opposed to in my world, there's some people who even go and ask forgiveness from someone who actually is supposed to ask them forgiveness. But they take themselves out of the picture because for the sake of shalom, for the sake of peace, I'll ask forgiveness, let there be peace, and then Hashem can come and dwell in, within us. So there was a... a just a, a small example that was a, how we can change the way we think very, very quickly. Um, there, was a, there was a guy in shul, an older, an older man in shul, who was extremely bothered by a noise that a younger boy was, uh, a young boy was making. He was pulling backwards and forwards his chair and he was making a lot of squeaking noise. And the, and the older man got really annoyed with him, told him off, he didn't stop. And the tones went up and the volume went up and eventually he was shouting at the boy. And then the boy looked at him and saw that he was doing that. And he pulled something out of his pocket and he put it in his ears. And the man suddenly realized, right, when he realized, and the boy said, excuse me, were you saying something? And the boy, and the man said, no, 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 everything's fine. In one, in one second, his whole way of thinking changed. It's, it's all in our mind. It's all in our mind. Um, it says, Machshava, Ben Machshava are the same letters as Besimcha, which I've mentioned to this group before. 
בשמחה, being בשמחה, being happy, starts in the head. מחשבה means a thought. The word thought in the Lashon HaKodesh is the same letters as simcha. Besimcha is machshava. It's the same exact letters. Which leads me to another point, which is in the, in the Lashon HaKodesh, in the language of the Torah, it's made of words uh, which are made of letters. The Hebrew letter that the, 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 the letters of the Torah are not random at all, and they're not like the alphabet or any other language. They are created of, of the, the joining different letters. So it's called tsirufim. So for example, an aleph is made of a diagonal vav and two yuds, one, one this way, one that way. I have a, I have a book somewhere that illustrates that. I'm, good, I'm just gonna show you, I'm not just gonna show it to you. See this Aleph? The Aleph is made of a, of a Vav, in the, vav the diagonal and the Yud upside down and the Yud up, the right way up. Yeah? So that's an example of how the Hebrew letter, the, the Jewish, oh, it's more clear here, with this little one down here. Can you see it? Yeah? So the, the Yud represents the, the, the world above. The yud below represents the, the represents a, the, the world down here, and the vav is a connecting letter in in the Jewish language. The vav is a connecting letter, which is why it's called a vav. Vav literally means a hook, which is a object of connection. Anyway, so in our mind we have the ability to think in words. This is a very very deep, um, I would say, kabbalistic thought. Um, in the secret of, of Torah, it's, it's brought a lot. The concept of the fact that our machshava, our thought, is made of tsirufe osios, of, of different combinations of letters, which means different words can be made of the same letter. For example, oneg, which is pleasure, if it's coming from the right source, its connection to Hashem. So we have Oineg Shabbos. We have the pleasure of Shabbos. We have um, spiritual Oineg, which, which is, which is uh, the, the ultimate connection to Hashem. But if you have a pleasure, which is a wrong pleasure, which is, for example, physical pleasure, which is um, wrong, for example, I know, eating, eating non-kosher food, for example. So it's taking pleasure from the world in a forbidden way. Then the Oneg, ayin, nun, gimel, turns into nega, nun, gimel, ayin. The many, many, many words like that. And in fact, the entire holy language of the, of the Torah is made of, of, of that. Basically, our thoughts are combination of letters. Hashem created the world with a combination of letters. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an unbelievable world, the world of letters. So... In my mind, I can change the way I'm thinking. I can change who I am. I can change my, my reality itself through the changing of the combination of letters in my head. And the Rizal and other Kabbalistic uh, Sephorim bring down that the, the, our thoughts are vessels. They're vessels that, contain, that can contain the light of Hashem. And basically, the thought that you have in your head will change the type of bounty that you get from Hashem, where they will be positive or negative, where they will be light or where, where they will be dark. It is such a phenomenal thing and it is such a tool. And the way that the Torah looks at a difficulty that we have, any challenge that comes your way is equal to opportunity. Opportunity to do a dame le elioid. I will be like Hashem. I will take this challenge. I will cling to Hashem through this. Therefore, I'll be able to stay happy 
And with that, I'll be able to get closer to Hashem and actualize my potential and actually live in an existence of happiness. I'm going to give you examples from, uh, from the Torah. Um, does anyone know how long I have? Sipi? No, okay, I'm, I'm just going to go on. Okay. Um, I'm 40 just, minutes? 40 minutes? 40 minutes? 40 minutes. Okay, fine. So the, I'll tell you uh, the, the story of a boy that went through a very, very difficult experience. I'm going to, I'm going to um, go through the story and then tell you how this boy was helped in order to understand the point. So... So this this um, this kid within a in a, in Israel. This is going back about thirty years ago in a in a yeshiva for struggling kids, and um, the, um, um, one of the staff members walked into the walked inside to the to the yeshiva and you saw in the courtyard these two guys fighting. Um, these okay, great, fine, excellent, uh, yeah, fine. Um, okay, so this kid this kid is fighting. Uh, with another child and the staff member goes past and the, as he goes past the Rosh Hashiva comes down and says right you have to intervene this is really bad he goes no let them sort themselves out they always fight their fine after um, and the Rosh Hashiva said no 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 this time it's really bad so he, they separate them and the one goes upstairs and the next one goes down to the side of the to the side of the yeshiva he sits on the on the low wall and he he's in, a, in hysterics crying, he's sobbing, he's in a very bad way. So the, the mashgiach, which is the, the, the staff member who got involved with him, got him into his, sent someone to buy lollies and stuff for him. I slowly, it was a very hot summer's day, and he took him for a ride out of Jerusalem to a nice little area by Motza, very, very built up now and very beautiful. At the, at, in the day, it was quite, um, it was just like um, nature. And there were the, the pond, there were the, they arrived there, this spring there where there were all breasts of a Hasidim dancing. So the the the, mashgiach, the the staff member tried to get the guy out of the car. The guy refused to come out of the car. He went down to the spring and he said to those Hasidish, uh, the breast of a guys who were dancing, guys, I need your help, please. I see that I've got a guy in the car refusing to come out. I need him in the water. Anyway, got him out. They, they came there, tried to get him out. He refused. They said, right, there's four of us, there's four limbs, one arm each, one leg each, right, let's go. They take him, they dunk, dunk him into the water. Okay, but a massive war breaks out, he's very angry with them, he's in his clothes, fully clothed, very summer, very hot summer's day, but eventually he actually calms down, the water does him good, he um, comes out and the rabbi says to him, come, let's go talk. And they go to a nearby um, an area, nice area and they they sit and they talk and the rabbi says to him right okay come on tell me what happened and she was this morning and he said do you really want to know do you really want to know my story i don't think you want to know my story and he said well i do i want to know the whole thing the boy came out with a horrific horrific story of a um broken uh, he was he was born he was born with a with a heart with a heart which, which ended it, he, he had many surgeries through his childhood. Um, and he didn't grow up with a lot of means. When he, just shortly after his bar mitzvah, his father ran off with a non-Jewish lady, left the family, and um, obviously stopped keeping anything he was keeping. He went, he went off, um, stopped keeping any Torah mitzvahs and went to live elsewhere, left the family and cut off all connection. The mother became very bitter. She had no means and the child, the, the two brothers, he, and he was one of three. The one, the oldest brother went off with the father. The middle brother took himself to a yeshiva in a dorm somewhere, didn't come back, didn't see them. And this little 13 year old boy who had heart problems, um, so he's, he's medically under some sort of care, um, was in a bad way emotionally, and his mother took all her anguish out on him, on him. He wanted her to buy him clothes. He was growing. She had no money. She said, he said, I'm going to go to the rabbi of the neighborhood and ask him for some money to buy me clothes. 
to which she got, she went mad with him, you know, you're going to humiliate me that I don't have money. Um, so he had, he had no money. He had no, he had nothing. He felt like a nothing who had nothing. Um, shortly after that, he woke up one morning with a terrible, terrible um, condition in his leg. It was as big as a watermelon. He got himself an ambulance um, went to hospital. His mother didn't show much interest in him. Unfortunately, uh, he was in hospital for the next six months uh, with many surgeries. Um, his, the, the, the middle brother came to visit him a few times. Um, he actually had quite a bit of a respite in hospital because he felt nobody is asking him any questions. He doesn't need to go to, he doesn't need to show up in shul without his father and people wondering where his father is. He was clothed, he was fed. He had he physically he was taken care of so actually in a way it was not so bad um after six months of hospital he was released and he was sent home his mother said go to yeshiva which yeshiva do you want me to go to where do you want me to go i don't know where to go i don't know what to um he called his father up and said can i come and live with you i don't have anything here and his father said yes but on condition that you do not show any signs of religious um, fine. So he comes and he hides the fact that he does want to be religious. You know, he can't. So he left his villain back at home and he he walked around the bit and he found a, a synagogue in the area to which he asked somebody to let him have to fill in for the morning. Every morning he would sneak out, go to shore, later fill in, hang around the bit, come back. And with time, slowly, slowly, he studied a bit more in, in, in the shul and tried to not turn lights on and off on Shabbat in his father's home. At some point, his father realized what was going on and said to him, you know, it's a religion of me, and basically chucked him out. He begged for just money for the journey home, got the money for the journey home, came home, and his mother said, what do you want of me? Go to yeshiva. Where do you want me to go? He knocked and knocked, begged his mother to just come home. No, you betrayed me. You went to your father. I have nothing to do with you. I'm sorry I'm sharing with you such a difficult story, but it's to bring a point out. And um, and he basically, his mother then said he was harassing her by knocking and knocking and called the police. So he went downstairs um, and he just sat down on a wall outside the building and cried his heart out because he felt he had nothing in the world. He didn't have money, he didn't have clothes, he didn't have, he didn't have love, he didn't have, he, he said he felt like a rotten tooth that needs to be pulled out of the mouth. And Hashem, why did you put me here in, in, in the first place? What's the point of me being here? At that point, a, a, a young um, married man went past, saw him there, asked, you know what happened, took him into his own home, fed him, clothed him, got his to fill in from his mother's home, and then looked for the correct place for this boy to actually be in, and eventually found him this, this yeshiva for kids at risk, uh, struggling children, and, and this is where he got into a fight with this um, other kid who was not very nice to him, and in this fight, actually, him quite hard in his leg, which had still stents and different things, um, you know, screws and whatnot in it. He was in a lot of pain and it just broke him. That, that final, it was a final straw that took him back to that experience outside his home where the police was calling him on him because he just wanted to go home. At that point, he stopped and said to the rabbi, now you understand? I don't need to be here. There's no point in me being in this world. So I want to share with you what the rabbi said to him, which I think is extremely, extremely powerful for every single one of us. So the rabbi said to him, in order to understand our pain, I want to, we need to look at people who suffered with pain, um, who were our leaders, who were our shepherds, in, and, and how they dealt with it. So we... We took, we, we go back to Abraham Avinu, who went through many, many troubles and tribulations. And we go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump, 
I'm going to jump to Yosef and come back to the others. Um, Yosef grew up as an orphan. He, he was orphaned from his mother at a young age. And his father took him under his wing in a very big way. He saw him as his disciple and he, and he taught him all the secrets of Torah that he knew, that he learned from Shem Ba'eva. Um, and he was his disciple, he was his continuation. The brothers were obviously very jealous of him because that was obviously not what they saw fitting. And he led a very different life to his brothers who were out and about, and he was just there with his father, famous, you know, the, with the famous um, Sinus, Sinus Pasim, his special garment that his father sewed him. And one day his father sends him out to the field to check on his brothers. On the way, he meets Gabriel, the angel who says to him, don't go there. Um, he warned him. Uh, he didn't heed to the warning, went to his brothers. The rest, we know what happened. His brothers wanted to kill him. They believed he did wrong and deserved wrong. I, I'm not going into the judgment of what they did and why they did, because they were huge tzaddikim. They were such great people that they had a whole entire going on. And, and the Gemara said that Hashem joined them into the into the Torah. And according to their judgment, they were not necessarily wrong. I'm just saying this so that we don't, you know, that we don't understand the full picture. However, they judged him a certain way. They believed he should die. Reuven comes and intervenes and suggests they just chuck him into the pit. What do we know about this pit? The, the Pasuk's verse says it was empty. There was no water in it. Rashi says to us there, there was no water, but there were snakes and scorpions. There's a massive learning um, piece there. It's a whole share in its own right. It's really quite, um, have a look at it um, if you can at some point. Um, it teaches us all about Hashgah HaPratis and what, what, what a man is deserving he will get, meaning if he was deserving of death, the snakes and the scorpions would get him. Um, you know, the, men, the humans can affect us more than animals can affect us because they're part of nature. They don't have Bechira. Anyway, he was then taken out of the pit and sold on to the merchants who had passed. He, he was taken and he was, he was humiliated in the most degrading way um, at, in a slave's market. The way they did it, they addressed the slaves. They came by with the physicians, checking the slaves all over. They then used to whip them and until they would stop reacting to the whip, they would say, okay, now he's a good... Now he's a good, um, he can be a good slave because he, he knows the master. He needs to know what the master would do anyway. So he's taken, he's sold to Potiphar, who becomes his master, and he's then not treated in the best of ways at Potiphar's. Bear in mind, he's a 17-year-old boy. Think of our teens today at the age of 17, year 12, six formers. Think of yourself at 17. He's, he's away from his father. His father doesn't actually know where he is. He knows his father doesn't know where he is. And there's no way his father's coming to look for him because his father has no idea where he is. And he doesn't have a mother. He's hated by his brothers. He's a strange, he had nobody, nobody in the world. And through that, through the next, the next big test comes his way which is Potiphar's wife, who tries to seduce him and tries to have relations with him. He then, Rashi says, you know, he brings up in front of his face the image of his father, holds it up against him, and he's able to withstand and run away. Let's pause a minute. He runs away. Imagine him running through the streets of Egypt, away from the, from the home of his master, and during that time, what is going, the, the thoughts are racing, racing through his head. He's thinking, Hashem, listen here. I need to have a conversation with you. I was sold by my brothers. I was degraded. I was humiliated. Through it all, I saw it was all Midas Hadin that was coming to me. And it, Hashem is kind. I'm with you, Hashem. 
I didn't let go of my belief and my emuna in you, Hashem, for one bit. I know you love me, Hashem, and I know you're with me, and you will never leave me. I cling to you, Hashem. Even when he went down in the, in the, in the horse and wagon towards Egypt, and there was a nice smell in the wagon, as opposed to a bad smell in the wagon, he recognized, this is Hashem sending me a sign with you. You have a good smell there with you in the wagon, instead of the smell of petrol, or, you know. So he appreciated at every moment that Hashem was with him to the point that at that moment, imagine him saying, Hashem, what reward are you going to give me for all this, you know, clinging to you despite all the difficulty? And Hashem goes, how does a reward of 10 years in prison with a bonus of two sound to you? And that's the end of the conversation. He is caught. He's framed. He's sent into the dungeon. He cannot see if it's day. He cannot see if it's light. And for 10 years, every day, he clings to Hashem and he remains happy. To the point that when the butler and the baker had a sad face on their faces, he said to them, why are your faces saddened? What's wrong today? Why are you not happy? In other words, you have no reason to be unhappy. You're in the dungeon. Nobody knows where you are. You can be here till you rot. Nobody will know. Yet he was happy and he clung to Hashem. And he did not lose faith in Hashem for one moment. When he did quiver and said to the butler and the baker, remember me when you go out, he was then given two years more as a gift in prison. Fast forward. Two years later, one day to the next, he's whipped out of prison, taken to, to Pharaoh, the king. He's made to be second in command in the whole of Egypt. And Pharaoh presents him with a wife. Who was Yosef's wife? Yosef's wife was Osnat. Osnat was the daughter of Dina, which she bore to Shechem. The brothers wanted to kill Osnat because she came from an unholy connection. And Dina, um, uh, Yaakov protected Osnat. He took her in and he didn't let her out. He knew that if she's, let, if she's gonna go out, somebody will kill her. So he protected her for some years. And then when she was still quite young, I don't know what age she was, but not old. Yaakov, I, I, I'm not trying to understand this, and neither can you, but this is what happened. Yaakov travels with her somewhere and says to her, I'm leaving you here. This is where you'll be. Do not come back because you will not, you, can, you cannot come back. Osnat sits there on the bush um, and merchants go by and they ask her what her story is and they take her with them to Egypt. And who adopts her as a daughter? Potiphar and his wife. There's 42,000 kilometers, miles, I don't know, in the, in the, in the, on the globe, around the globe. And from all places in the world, Osnat is taken to the same home that Yosef was taken to. He is then presented to Yosef. She then presented to Yosef by power to marry. He knew who she was. She was his niece, and they marry. Osnat herself never lost faith in Hashem for one moment. What happens fast forward some years? Yaakov Abinu comes to live in Egypt. Yaakov, his father, comes to live in Egypt, and just before his death, he says to Yosef, bring me in your sons, and I will bless them. Yosef brings his sons in to Yaakov. Yaakov's response is, me, me, Ele, me, Ele. And Yosef answers, Ele, him, Bonai, Shechanan, Oti, Ha'iloikim. These are the children that Hashem, our God, blessed me with. 
Why does Yaakov say mi ele? Mi ele is the same letters as Elohim, God. When we say Hashem, and, and the writing in the Siddur is Yud and Yud, it's Hashem's, it's Hashem's name, which we relate to in, or the Hashem relates to us through the Midas HaChesed, through kindness. When we say Elohim, it's Hashem's, it's Hashem's, um, relate, uh, Hashem relates to us through Midas Hadin, Midas, the Midas uh, of just. So when Yaakov saw Ephraim and Menashe coming into his room, he saw a cloud of a Elohim come into the room. He saw Hashem himself through Midas Hadin coming into the room. And he understood that these two holy people were a product of unbelievable clinging to Hashem through the experience of Din, without seeing Chesed, without experiencing necessarily the kindness of Hashem, yet seeing Hashem and being connected to Hashem through it all. And he did something which changes uh, the, the fate of Amisrael for, for generation. It changes the whole understanding and our thinking, which he says, I will bless the Israel with them. And he says, Yesimcha Elohim, he actually did it like this. Yesimcha Elohim, ke Ephraim v'chi menashe. Every Shabbos, when all the parents bless their children on Shabbos on Friday night, they say, Yesimcha Elohim, ke Ephraim v'chi menashe. They don't say, Yesimcha Elohim, ke Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. Ke Ephraim v'chi menashe. Like these two boys, who are a product of parents who clung to Hashem through difficulty, through living in a place of impurity, yet staying connected, never losing sight of that which is right. Yosef went through unbelievable pain. I want to visit another shepherd of ours, which was David Hamelech, King David. He brings into Hillen some of his story it is i mean it's you know you see it all across yes david hamelech was the eighth child of yishai he was viewed by his brothers not as a brother and the pasuk says it to him muzar hayiti le'echai i was strange to my brothers v'nochri livnei imi and i was estranged from my brothers, from my mother. And he continues, Avi ve'imi azavuni, my parents left me. Where does he find Salah? Salah, how do you say Salah? Salah. He finds Nechama v'hashem ya'asfeni. He never loses sight of the fact that Hashem is with him. Therefore, doesn't become depressed. He plays the music. The whole of the book of Tehillim is a gift to us because David went through challenges, because David went through difficulties. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, each and every one of them went through tremendous, tremendous difficulties. Yet, if you start going through the stories, right, with with the ten, the ten, the ten tests that Abraham went to, Yitzchak with his own test, the, the, the huge test of the Akedah, where he was the, the binding of Isaac, when he was actually willing to give his own life away to Hashem, and, uh, and a, a huge test that he had when Yaakov came to take and took the brachas, and he realized a moment after he gave him the brachas, when Esau comes in, and he realizes, hey, I made a mistake in my thinking. The whole time I was wrong, actually. Yaakov was right, the brachas were his, and he immediately accepts that he was wrong and says he was, yes, and he will be blessed. And he seconds his blessing in front of Esau that it was right. And it was a huge blessing because it's taking your, if any ego that he had, if any, and saying, mm, it's not me, it's Hashem. 
Hashem was right, I was wrong. I accept. Yaakov being chased, being downtrodden, being swindled, being tricked. He, he goes from one place, he's tricked with Rachel, he's tricked with Leah, he's tricked with all his, with the sheep. He then runs away from Lavan and he gets a problem with Asaph, and then he gets a problem with Dina. He loses Rachel, his wife, when she was young. It's like one tsar after another. His life is made of so many tsaras, you, can, you can't even number them. And each and every one of them had such acceptance of Hashem's will over their own. They accepted that whatever Hashem does is for the best, and they clung to Hashem in such a big way. They then, they, they then received unbelievable bounty in, in a form of where there was money, that they, they were very, very wealthy, and the Pasuk tells us on each and every one of them how wealthy they were, you know, to, um, and Hashem Barach is Abraham Bakol, Yitzchak, that he had the Me'ah Sharem, and plus more, he had more than Abimelech. There's many places, there's plenty of places to describe it. Yaakov, he had plenty, Bechol Sharem, Ufarat, so Yama, Bekeh, Nafapol, Abanegva, he had, you know, everywhere he went. And then we continue, Moshe and Aaron. Moshe had, the amount of suffering that Moshe had been, being ripped away from his mother as an infant, being, having to run away from the country, then being thrown into the dungeon for 10 years in Midian, yet again, clings to Hashem, sees Hashem in everything. And then um, and then we see, uh, again, also the blessing that he had, that he, that he got to be the one delivering the Torah and sharing the whole Torah, being so close to Hashem. We have Aaron that had enormous, enormous amount of pain, enormous amount of pain. He said, you know, his two sons, died on the first day of the Mishkan, the first day they came there, the whole big celebration, and he comes in, and what does he see? His two beloved sons, dead. And what does he respond? Vayidom HaHaron, he kept silent. Even in his, in his heart, he didn't judge. Even in his heart, he says, Hashem, I accept. It all and it all starts in the mind, machshava besimcha, to keep the simcha in your so you you arrange the thoughts in your head with words. The combination of letters in your words become a vessel to contain Hashem's light, Hashem's love, and then you can carry on with it. You can take all your pain, all your challenges and channel them for the good. And every time you connect with Hashem, when you have a challenge, when you're thrown a challenge at you, difficulty, whether it's with Parnassa, with livelihood, whether it's with difficult people in your life, whether it's with illnesses, whether it's with children, not having children, difficult children. And if you at that time say, Hashem, I receive this opportunity, I see this challenge, I understand that it's an opportunity. You want me to do Adame the Elyon. I want to be close to you, Hashem, by being like you, Hashem. I want to actualize the potential and utilize every single one of my character traits, of my tendencies, of my strengths, and of my weaknesses to become close to you, Hashem. How? By overcoming that which I which I struggle with, recognizing recognizing that being besimcha is my actual avoider. It's actually my way of serving Hashem. How do I serve Hashem? By being happy. That recognizing that when a negative thoughts come into my head, that is the yeta hara, the evil inclination dressed up in a thought, and it's a snake. It's a snake that came to Eve eat from the tree. It's a snake that came to Adam, but in the right, you need to be, you will be like Hashem, and to convince to do, to do, sometime, sometime the snake comes to us in a form of a good thought, right? I, you need to, you need to recognize in how it comes to you, and shove it away, and say, no, I am not going to take that. I'm going to, when I'm saying good thought, I mean, for example, if you Let's say you need to look after your family, and at that point you get uh, you get the bug to say to him, 
Okay, maybe it's not the right thing to say to him, but the Yetahara know that at this point, you need to look after your father, or you need to help a child, or you need to help a neighbor. But instead of that, you're going to be holy and say to him, right? You need to, I'm not saying it's wrong to say to him, it's very, very important, and very, very special to say to him, but at the right time. And you need to recognize that the Yetahara, the snake, comes to us in all different forms. But the biggest form, I think, it comes in this generation is depression and sadness. This month is the month of Simcha. It's a month of happiness. And, and that means the, the power of Simcha that is very, very much there. The, in, the time has energy. The, 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 time, the time has energy in it. And the energy of Ada is, is Simcha. And therefore, we need to ride the wave. I often think about it. We need to just ride the wave. So a negative thought comes into your head. Tell yourself, Adam and Elion, I want to be like Hashem. I want to be with Simcha. I'm not going to let that thought come into my head. I'm going to rearrange the letters in my brain to be a positive thought. And this has to be a conscious way of thinking. And then by changing and rearranging the thought in your head, you are creating a vessel to contain more light from Hashem. And the bounty, from the positiveness will come from Hashem and will just go through you. And you can then be, do take another step forward towards actualizing your potential and being a partner with Hashem in making man. Good Shabbos. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. It was beautiful. Jesse, thank you very, very much. It was really... You. That was really inspiring. It was beautiful. Thank, thank you. Very much. Gorgeous, so, Jesse. So what happened things. to the boy in the story? Sorry, oh, was... uh, the boy in this story I'll share with you actually did tremendously well. Sorry, I didn't finish with a positive note uh, on that way. He, he recognized from that moment on that it gave him tremendous, tremendous chizuk. And he realized that he was like Yosef, like David. He was, he had the power to connect to Hashem through the difficulty. So every time he was thrown another, another difficulty, he looked at it as an opportunity and not as a difficulty. He then was able to channel his own experiences in order to help other people.